Thank you, Jennifer, for coming on this morning and chatting with us about this very kind of dry topic. Um, but we do need as, as agents to know kind of how to dissect the uh, title report, at least on the, the surface level, and then lean on you guys um, to kind of dive into any you know other issues that, that may pop up or anything that's kind of unclear. So I think this morning you were going to kind of run through, I guess, you know, title a report and kind of show us all how to to go through it. Yes, I am. Um, and I will try to make it as interesting as possible, um, as interesting as it can be, uh, and not go into crazy detail on things that you may not ever encounter. This is what First American calls Eagle Pro 2. And so when we send out our files, we will send out a PDF and we will also send out a link to this system. And the reason why I like this system is because you can go to this report section and go through the report, but then you can also go to the supporting documents. And so you can email somebody directly from this system with the legal description or the title report or anything that you need, which I think is really great but we will jump right in. Okay, this is our page one. And I'll be um, happy to tell you that we're not gonna go over every single thing in this report, because there are absolutely pages that you do not need to worry about. And so I am going to let you know where those are. Okay, these people right here, Pat, Amy, and Jennifer, they're the title officers. And whenever I talk to a buyer, I let them know, you are likely never going to talk to them. But you as a realtor, anytime you see even the moderate question pop up, I would give them a call and ask them about it because that's how you're going to work through the process of learning exactly what everybody is. And then Michael Santucci, he is the ringleader. I always tell buyers they will hear from him a lot. He'll be bossing everyone around. He'll be responsible for everything in this report. But feel free to always give them a call if you have a question. Okay, and then the next thing that we see on this report is the order number. That's very important. If you have a question of them, I would give them the order number and then they're going to pull up the file right away. And you can see here are the people involved in this transaction. And I, of course, picked one of Ashley's files. So um, this one looks like you guys double ended, which is great. Here is the address for the report the property that we're researching. Okay, and then this is the uh, first page of the actual report. And so on purchase transactions, there's usually two policies. And so this is the page that's gonna let you know what policies there are. There is the owner's policy and there's the lender's policy. In our area, the owner pays for this policy, so the seller pays for the owner's policy, but it becomes a property of the buyer when it closes. And the second policy is the lender's policy, and this is the policy that's paid for by the buyer. Um, but I always tell buyers when I'm reviewing it with them, if this dollar amount's not in there, it's because it hasn't been finalized, but it's been given to them in a quote, probably three or four times. Lenders love to give quotes. Okay. This right here. This, Sorry, can I so interject? So um, if it's a cash transaction, though, the B would not exist. If there's a cash transaction, the buyer pays nothing for title insurance. They get title insurance, but the seller pays for it. Gotcha. So, yeah, great deal. Okay, number four right here. This is who we show vested in title. And this is probably one of the most important things that you're looking for. The way the First American does it is that when you guys order a title, um, you'll get the title report usually within 24 to 48 hours. And then you'll also get an email from the title unit giving you a breakdown of what might be red flags. Well, this number four who is in title, that might not be something that they're able to determine is a red flag because maybe you went to the listing appointment and it was Daniel and Kimberly and we have Daniel by himself. And that's not a red flag. It just means that we need to know that he is now married. And, but 
also, you will go to a listing appointment and there'll only be one person. And then the title report comes back to you and you're like, there's two people. Okay, well, that is something, it's not a red flag, but it's something we have to work through. And that's all you're looking for when you're reviewing titles is homework, things that you need to pay attention to. And so perhaps submit additional documentation. So it could be a divorce situation. It could be somebody has passed away. But it is important to identify that early because if it's a case where somebody is hard to find, then um, then we're going to have to do some research, right, to get them uh, able to sign. Okay. All right. Now we're coming up to one of the pages where what I would recommend is next time you get a title report, this page, Schedule B, Part 1, and the second page, Schedule B, Part 2. Um, these are not specific to your listing or your seller. Every single person in the state of Washington gets these like, same um, items on their report. So I would read it one time so you're familiar with it, and then I would never pay attention to it again. <laughs> That's very boring. One thing I will point out is um, this just came up for me a couple weeks ago. Um, this paragraph right here, especially on the older properties, there are going to be discrimination um, in the CCNRs on some properties. And so this paragraph right here negates that. That's against the law now. And so it's still a matter of public record. So it's going to be available to people for people to see. But this paragraph takes it out on every property. Yeah, and I've seen that um, from houses. Like I had a house in um, Broadview or up up north that had that in the little subdivision CCNRs, um, and they, I mean condominiums too. So it's like all different types of properties could have some sort of form of discrimination clause in their you know CCNRs or whatnot from back in the day. Yeah, it's it's um, it can be a little embarrassing, but at least we have that paragraph. Yep. Okay. So then as we scroll down here, um, now we're getting into the nuts and bolts of what is specific to your property. Um, this actually is, is just generic. The all uh, Paragraph number nine talks about excise tax. All sellers in the state of Washington pay excise tax. And so when I'm talking to a buyer, I let them know this doesn't pertain to you until you go to sell. Everybody pays it when they go to sell. Um, okay. And then this... Paragraph number 10, these are county property taxes. Everybody pays. Them. And so this is Michael's responsibility to make sure it's paid down to the penny on the day of closing because most times the seller will have prepaid their taxes and they'll end up giving the buyer a little bit of a credit for the time that they didn't own it, but they paid for it on the day. And that's all Michael's responsibility or the escrow option responsibility, whoever that may be. Okay. And item number 11, this you'll see on most properties, this is a deed of trust, which is a mortgage. And so this is the escrow officer's responsibility to make sure this is paid off. Providing title to the buyer that's free and clear is of that own support. Okay. Paragraph number 12, this is one that we don't see all the time, but we've seen it a lot this year. This is letting you know that the assessed value is this dollar amount and the purchase price is this dollar amount, which means the buyer is getting a great deal, right? Um, this year that's happening as prices are coming down a little bit. Um, in a different climate, that might be a red flag to the county. They're going to be like, hey, where's my tax money? I want more excise tax. But in this market, that's just unfortunately the way it is for sellers. Great for buyers, you know, finally. Right? Okay. Paragraph number 13. This, this Sorry, one. Can I come in really quick? Oh, yes. Uh, could we get, I don't know, uh, some more detail on that? I think that is a really interesting part, number 12. I don't know. Is there anything else you can say about it to make it more clear? It's just like, the assessed value from the appraisal. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. The assessed value comes from the tax assessor. And uh -huh. so King County is pretty good about reassessing your property as often as they think they can get an increase in money from you. 
And so usually for me, that's about every year. And so the assessed value that they're, that they're talking about here is what the county has decided this is what the property's worth. And so when the title department sees the contract and they, they see that the county's assessment of this property is more than the purchase price, in a normal market, they would think that that would actually prompt the county on day of recording to be like, wait a minute, something fishy is going on here. Because if they think that, like in situations where bankruptcy um, sales in this area, those are reduced by the amount of money that the buyer has to come in and pay cash for. Usually it's like, $25,000 and um, the county will say, hey, wait a minute, I see your purchase price is this, we're gonna bump it up to this price and we're gonna charge you tax based on the higher dollar amount. They wouldn't do that in this market because our prices are, are normalizing a little bit. And so that's just letting you know that it could be a red flag. The county might say, hey, wait a minute, where's my money? Okay. So does that okay. Clear up? Yes, thank you. Okay, this homestead paragraph, this has to do, you're going to see this on every title report where either the seller or the buyer is an unmarried individual because um, it is very common for someone to buy a property as an unmarried individual and then become married. And if that's the case, there is um, rights that that spouse has and they might need to sign. Um, and so we're going to protect ourselves by letting you know that we need to know everyone's marital status. So that's very common. One, um, one thing I want to mention is that the main thing that you're looking for is homework. So you're looking for calls for extra documentation. And uh, you don't need to to require um, documentation on whether they're married or not, because they'll accept that via email or even on the phone. But you're looking for, um, if it's a trust, if it's um, an LLC, if there's an estate. So for a trust, they're gonna need to see the whole trust agreement because they have to decide who has the authority to sign. And so, um, whether it's an LLC and you're talking about the operating agreement or a trust and you're talking about the whole trust. Um, and then in regards to an estate, they may ask for the death certificate. They may ask for the will if there is one. Um, if there's a probate involved, they're able to pull that up themselves because it's court work. But you're looking for items that are uh, requiring extra work on your part. And um, one of the things this, this uh, seller's name is Daniel Smith. I was surprised that we didn't see numerous matters on this report, his name is Daniel Smith. And that would be when um, somebody has a common name, like Jennifer Peterson, and they uh, all of a sudden, all of these weird things like judgments and this and that are gonna show up on the property. They recognize this is a common name. And so they'll put a paragraph in there that says, um, you need to complete this form. The seller needs to complete this form in order to determine that isn't that person. And I'm going to give you an example. My maiden name is Squidlet. Very weird name, awful when you're in junior high. And so I was super excited to go from being Jennifer Squidlet to being Jennifer Peterson because that is a very common name. Um, well, Jennifer Squidlet is just me. So if there are any matters that show up anywhere, those belong to me. But Jennifer Peterson, there's a million Jennifer Petersons. In fact, I have one doctor where there's eight Jennifer Petersons. And um, so I end up with a ton of numerous matters, which are not um, things you have to worry about until you determine they actually belong to your party. And so I have to fill out that identity affidavit. And that is a form that title will give you with the title report and then your seller has to fill it out. It's a bit intrusive. Uh, it asks your past addresses, whether you've been married, what your what your um, previous names may have been. Um, I did love filling out myself, but then what my letter required 
is that from now on, every time I am on a property, it has to be Jennifer Janice Peterson. And so that's how I avoid that because Jennifer Peterson is common. Jennifer Janice Peterson is not common. And so they're going to know anything other than uh, with a different middle name is not mine. So that's going to save me some headache, hopefully. So that's, I guess it's important for when some of our sellers, whenever we go mutual, right? Um, and the seller packet gets sent out to them. A lot of people kind of procrastinate on filling that out because it is kind of lengthy and you do have to go in and provide all this information, but it's something that just helps kind of prepare for any delays that could occur or any issues that could arise from the title report with any of these common name matters, or let's say someone else is on the deed or you know whatever has interest in the property, that type of thing. So it still is important for them to put in the upfront time to get it done sooner than later. It's true. Yeah. Uh, very common that we see child support liens and um, we see DS, DSHS liens and things of that nature. And so we just have to determine it's not your party. And probably um, we, because it says Daniel R. Smith right here, that maybe have, a, have allevi alleviated a lot of different Daniel Smiths, which is great. Okay. Oh, and then another document you might be asked for is if there's a divorce, we can usually pull that court work unless the divorce was done in another state. Um, but sometimes the property settlement agreement is not a matter of public record. And that is what is going to determine whether one spouse or the other spouse was received the house, which is a big deal. So We'll, we'll get what we can get on our end. And then we may ask you for additional documentation. So the, the party might have to provide us with a, a couple of pages from their divorce. What did you, what did you call that specifically? Did you say property, was... that property settlement agreement? Got it. Okay. And then if they've filed for separation, is that through the court? And so you guys would potentially see that too. Okay. Yes. So separation and or divorce settlement. Yes. And then, um, the, we're hoping for a, a final decree because final. if there is a divorce filed, if you ever encounter a couple that is thinking of getting divorced, ask them to hold off on filing until after the sale of their property because you can still do it. If they're amicable, it's no big deal. That just means that both parties have to sign. But if somebody files for divorce, but it's not final, whatever is in that paperwork doesn't matter yet because a judge could turn, could overrule it. And uh, they could say, this isn't a fair settlement. We're going to do it this way. And then the house actually could be something that initially was put in the um, petition that didn't end up being finalized. So as long as both parties are willing to sign, it's totally okay. It's just that it won't be that we'll only have the person um, that looks like they might be a ward of the house sign because that might end up getting over overruled. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, anytime you see a blue hyper a blue um, document here, it's a hyperlink, and so you will see. Um, oh, and I'm going to pull this up. Okay, you can see it. Yay! Can you see it? All right. Perfect. Um, and this is just an interesting point of note. All of this stuff was done by hand back in the day. So that's pretty neat. Buyers always are interested in hearing that when I tell them that. But um, we label things as CCNRs often when they're not really CCNRs. So don't see the word CCNR and get freaked out and say, hey, wait a minute. I was told there was no CCNR. Well, this was this document was from the, when the um, house was built. And so they throw it under there. Okay, and then we're going to see easements. And I always tell buyers easements are a piece of property that you own, but you the property has given permission for somebody else to use it. And so that is usually for utilities. And we don't actually, especially if I can see, okay, here's an easement right here. It's for the sewer. I don't think there's any need to open that because um, obviously it's a sewer easement. I'll have to tell you that 
I went out of my way to look for one of your files to use an example that was a single family residence because condos are crazy. There's always, I mean, sometimes there are like 30 easements, um, you know, from the construction period and things like that. And so that's always a little confusing to people. One one point on that too, for condominiums underneath the CCNRs. Um, so they'll have their the declaration, the actual CCNRs for the property. Um, but are the amendments that have been filed also within those docs on the title report? Yes. Okay. So all of them, if they're recorded and actually went through the HOA properly to amend original documents, then they'll be a hundred percent in the title report. Yes, absolutely. You know, if there are 30 amendments, there'll be 30 documents there that you can hyperlink to. And yep. just a point of note, when it comes to reviewing the CCNRs, um, this is what I always tell a buyer because we can't, we're not going to, I'm not going to go over every single CCNR with them on Zoom on an appointment. And it's not my place, it's not my expertise, and it's not your expertise to interpret that. And so it is really on the buyer. The buyer really needs to review those CCNRs themselves because they're the only ones that know how they're gonna use the property in the future. Like, let's say it's a house and the CCNRs say, you cannot paint your house any other than these four colors. And they're like, I really wanted a purple house. My whole life I wanted a purple house. Well, that's not going to be a red flag to anybody other than the buyer. So they really need to read it. Okay. This paragraph right here is always in every single title report. It always has to do with the buyer being an LLC or, or the seller. Anyone in the property being an LLC in the party of it, because that's going to require additional homework on our part to make sure that it's legit. And what is that is actually what is a GTO? Excuse me? What is a GTO? Geographic targeting order. And I don't know what that means, but really this came up when um, they had that list of people that were um, foreign entities that they, they deemed um, terrorists mm -hmm. and things like that. And so they didn't want to, any assets they held over here um, they're going to research it and they're going to take them. So um, this is a government uh, paragraph that you only have to worry about if there's an LLC. Got it. And that's um, the rest of this report is, you know, here is the address and it's just informational notes. And here the last page is always the legal description, the exhibit A. And does anyone have any other questions? Because I have come to the close. Nice, thank you. That was quick and efficient. So let's say you go initial, we get the title report, um, we go through it. We kind of see, all right, there might be a couple red flags here um, with your process. Um, you guys call those things out. I know most of the time, you know, we'll get kind of like a, hey, we need this or, or whatnot, but, um, asking us you guys are also in contact with the client too so we could also what's easier i guess within your process of us getting documents you speaking with the client directly to get those or would you still like us to be involved in trying to get those documents it depends on uh when you order preliminary title when you're um, getting ready to put a listing on the market there is no buyer involved so if that situation um escrow is not involved escrow is actually responsible for clearing title and so Michael will work with the buyer and the seller in order to get everything worked out. But if you want to be very proactive and take care of some of these actions, especially in the state, um, that's because there are so many potential documents that have to be filled out. I would do that. And that would be you working with your seller because the title department doesn't do that, but escrow does. And the, if we have um, documentation ahead of time, it's not necessary, but it's always the sooner the better. And I think for trust specifically, uh, it's good for us, especially when we're listing a property, we need to know who has the legal authority to sign the listing docs. Because if we yes. throw a property on the market and then find out later that, you know, uh oh, they're not the executor or whatever it is, it's stuck somewhere else, the property is status wise, then we're, that won't 
do any good for us. So that's, I think the trust is the number one thing that you kind of have to do a little bit more upfront work and then partnerships and or LLCs just to make sure that people have legit formations and they're not just saying, and it's showing up on title as being, you know, the LLC versus people just saying, because I've had that one too, uh, which you guys worked on where someone was like, no, this property is in this LLC. What well, wasn't on your guys's end. So then we had to track down that LLC that had been dissolved years ago and, you know, figure it all out. Yeah, that's that's a definitely big pile of homework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And really, if you want to send us the trust documents or the LC documents early, they, the title officer will upload it into the file and review it and say, this is the person that needs to sign. So yep. if you don't want to just come through a document, we'll do it for you. Because yep. we need it anyway. And then for services for our buyers, let's say, you know, we're, we're repping a buyer and, <clears throat> and the first uh, Americans doing the, the title uh, poll and, and research for that. Are you guys do kind of a consultative call with our buyers or can just to kind of go? I around? offer, I offer it to the buyer. They don't all take me up on it. Some of the, the first time home buyers are like, yes, I have no idea what this document is. Please tell me what it is. But people that are, They've gone through multiple transactions before. They're usually like, yeah, I don't, I don't need a Zoom yeah. point with you. Got it. Sweet. All right. I think that that's all I had. If there's no okay. other calls, thank you so much for your time today and um, appreciate your support and help. Okay. Thank you. You guys have a good day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.